I wonder if you've ever had uh, this experience on Wikipedia. Um, you, you start, uh, you look something up because you need to know about it, and uh, you, you start reading the article, but then a hyperlink catches your eye and you click on it. And then you start reading that article and then, oh, there's another link and you click on that. And, and then there's another, and you click on that and you click and you click and you click. And then you end up reading about tulip mania. I have no idea how I ended up reading about tulip mania about uh, 10 days ago, but that's where uh, I ended up, a million miles away from wherever I began. That sort of Wikipedia journey, it's like sociology's uh, six degrees of separation. You know how uh, any two people are only six connections apart uh, in the world. And I, I, I sort of mentioned that because these opening chapters of Genesis uh, have, have been compared to a Wikipedia uh, article because they, they throw up so many questions, so many things, if you like, that we want to click on and to uh, find out more about. So we read these words and we think, well, what does this say about me as a person, about my identity, my purpose? What does it say about my place in the world, how I'm to care uh, for the world? And of course, it speaks to those things. Well, we read it and we, we think, well, what about, um, this is what the Bible says, but what about what science says about the creation of the world? Like, can, can we reconcile those two things? Or, or maybe taking a step back, do we even need uh, to reconcile uh, those two things? And I could go on and I could go on. There are so many different issues that get thrown up by these opening chapters of Genesis. So many things that we could click on, uh, as it were. And they're really good things, really important things to think about. And uh, we we will engage with those things. And I'll say how we'll do that in just a moment. But but on um, a Sunday, what we're going to do is we're sort of going to work systematically through uh, these opening chapters uh, to sort of keep going with my Wikipedia analogy. We're going to uh, read the whole article uh, all the way uh, to the end to, to hear what it is that God wants us to hear, what the main thing uh, these chapters have to say to us. But to give a space to sort of click on the various things that interest us, in our midweek home groups, we're going to explore some of the issues that these passages uh, throw up. And indeed, this week in our home group, the first of those, we're going to be thinking about science because, you know, there are questions thrown up uh, by this bit of the Bible. But no matter how much we might want it to be, this, it's not a science textbook, uh, the opening chapters of Genesis, Genesis 1. Because, as, as maybe you heard Pontus uh, read it, it's, it's not so much bothered with the nuts and bolts of creation. Uh, rather, it's more interested in the why uh, of creation. And in fact, even that's not quite right. Because as I've spent more and more time uh, in this really familiar passage uh, this week, I've, I've been more and more persuaded that actually that the main concern here is the who of creation. Uh, the main concern of Genesis 1 is the God who made the world, the creator uh, himself. And Genesis 1, it wants to tell us about him as it speaks about his creation. Uh, it, it shows us what he is like and, and therefore how we're to relate uh, to him. And so that's what we're going to do uh, this morning. If you open up the order of service, the little outline there, you'll see four things that Genesis uh, 1, the bit of chapter 2, tells us about God, and therefore four ways in which we should uh, relate to him. In these verses, we see that God created the heavens and the earth, so we should worship him alone. We see that God spoke the world into being, so we should listen to his voice. Uh, we see God made us in his image. So we should rule as his representatives. And we'll see that God rested when his work was done. And so that we should come to him uh, for rest. Well, let's have a look at the first of those. God created the heavens and the earth. So we should worship him alone. And I don't know, as you come to a bit of the Bible like uh, Genesis, whether it feels um, uh, familiar to you, or whether the, the sort of world of Genesis feels very distant uh, to you. But actually, the time when uh, Genesis was written, 
when this biblical account of creation was um, uh, pen was put to paper, as it were, it was actually a time very similar uh, to our own. Uh, the, the sort of um, well, the way the New Testament talks about these opening books of the Bible, it says, it says they're written by Moses. And of course, you'll remember that uh, uh, Moses came out of Egypt and he was the one who wrote down the, the oral history of God's people that had been passed down uh, through the generations. And uh, they were much more careful with their oral history in those days. It wasn't like our sort of Chinese whispers way of talking where um, things get changed. Uh, they were really careful, and so we can trust that it was passed down carefully. And then Moses put pen to paper, and in the sort of world where he did that, there were all sorts of different religions uh, going around, wasn't there? There was uh, what was going on in Egypt, there was the Canaanite religions where they were going to, these competing worldviews, contradictory uh, philosophies that were all fighting for people's attention. And uh, a lot of these are, are written down, and you can you can go back and look at them. There are even fragments of them in places like the British Museum. And so we can see that in these other uh, religions, other worldviews, there was uh, one particularly popular account of creation that said that, that our world, it was a result of a battle between the gods and that one god had killed another god and, and used a dead god to make the world. Or a slightly different version of that story had uh, the gods not fighting one another, but fighting uh, mythical sea beasts and other wonderful creations that would belong uh, well in a Harry Potter film. And uh, these, these sort of mythical beasts represented the forces of chaos. And as the gods defeated them, order came, creation came. Or another view was that there wasn't just one god. There were a whole bunch of gods. And each, each, if you like, had their particular area of responsibility. There was the sun god, the rain god, the fertility god. Da, 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 da. Lots of different gods. And some of them were uh, intricately connected with their bit of creation, and some were really distant uh, from their part of creation. And it's into that world, a world not too dissimilar uh, to our own, of different religions, uh, competing worldviews, contradictory philosophies, that Genesis 1 speaks. And it says something that would have been very controversial uh, in its day. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so it goes on, continuing in that vein, God speaking, things happening. And the thing that would have really struck the original hearers of Genesis, the original readers of Genesis, is there's no fights mentioned, no battles between the gods. In fact, there are no other gods mentioned at all. Here's what um, the Bible wants us to know. It wants us to know that, that God, he has no competitors, no rivals, no peers. He alone is the creator. And the forces of chaos, which are being um, described in verse 2, when it speaks of the earth being formless and empty and the darkness being over the surface, of the deep, those, those sort of chaotic forces, they're not subdued in a great battle. What happens? God speaks. All it takes is a word and order starts to appear. It's not a, a, a battle, it's a peaceful creation. And then it's not like God made a little bit of the world, that he's just responsible for this corner uh, over here. No, he made the heavens and the earth, which is a way of saying he made everything. You know, when we say, I I've searched high and low, uh, you don't just mean I've looked on the top shelf and the bottom shelf. You mean you've looked absolutely everywhere uh, and you can't find it. And so it is here when the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. 
It also means he made everything uh, in between. And as the first uh, readers, first hearers of Genesis would have uh, heard these words, the question that would have been uh, raised in their mind was, well, why would you worship anyone else? Uh, why, why would you follow uh, a god who might be defeated the next time a, a, a fight breaks out in the pantheon of the gods up there? Why would you do that? Or, or why would you devote your life to a god who just has power over this very little area uh, of the world? Sure, they might be able to help you over here, but they're no good to you uh, over there. Why would you do any of that when you can turn to the unrivaled god over everything, who brings order out of chaos. And I don't know, as you, as you hear about those different uh, worldviews, different philosophies, different religions, whether you start to think, well, they were, I don't know, a bit behind the times. Well, if we're in danger of thinking that, I think actually we need to hear just the same message as uh, they needed to hear. Uh, Because while we might not be tempted to look to the other gods like they were, uh, aren't the idols of our heart just the same? Don't uh, money and power and sex and success and the approval in others and all those things that we might turn to, that we might look to to bring order in our life or that have power uh, over us in our lives. In the cold light of day, aren't those things just as limited, just as uh, warring, just as powerless in the face of chaos as some of those other gods I was describing a moment ago? You see, we too, we need to hear uh, that God created the heavens and the earth. And so we should worship him alone. First thing, uh, Genesis 1 tells us about God and therefore about ourselves. Here's the second. Uh, God spoke the world into being. And so we should listen uh, to his voice. Again, we've already uh, touched on this at the beginning of, of verse 3. Familiar words to many, no doubt. But it's worth letting the enormity of these words uh, really wash over you. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, even in our day of voice-activated light switches where Alexa or Siri can turn on everything in your house, this is something else. This is next level. And it doesn't stop with just the lights. I'm sure you'll have noticed it goes on. Verse 6, God said, and it was so. Verse 9, God said, and it was so. Verse 14, God said, and it was so. Verse 20, God said, and it was so. Verse 24, God said, and it was so. On and on and on. God spoke and chaos was put in its place. God spoke and plants popped up from the ground. God spoke and stars shone. God spoke and the waters teemed with living creatures. God spoke and animals appeared. Alexa and Siri can't do any of that. I've tried, it doesn't work. God's words, they bring order from chaos. They're powerful, creative, life-giving. And they bring about things that are good. Again, you'll have noticed as Pontus read these verses for us over uh, earlier, that refrain, and God saw that it was good. God saw that it was good again and again and again. And if God says that something is good, it's good. It's good. Because he doesn't settle uh, for second best. And so again, as you hear this description of God, of God, as the original readers heard this description of their creator. The question that it raises is this, well, will you listen to him? Will you listen to him? Sure, there'll be times when what God says confronts us. And maybe there'll be times that what God says makes us uncomfortable. 
But if, as Genesis 1 tells us, that, that God's words are things that bring order out of chaos, that have the power to change things, that bring about life, that bring about good things, don't you want those words in your life? God's word, it did all those wonderful things. Wouldn't we do well to, to trust him, to trust his promises, as the song spoke of? God spoke the world into being. And so we should listen to his voice. And then uh, number three, um, God made us in his image. And so we should rule as his representatives. Now, this one doesn't immediately jump off the page quite as readily as the first two. So I, I need to, um, to show you a bit of how Moses has put together uh, this account of creation in Genesis 1. Because in the six days of creation, uh, there's a pattern to God's work. Here it is. In, in the first three days of creation, God creates three different realms. So on day one, he creates uh, the realm of light and dark. Then on day two, uh, God creates the realms of the sky and the sea as he separates the waters. And then on day three, he creates the realm of the land. Three different realms. Light and dark, sky and sea, and the land. And then in the second uh, three days, God creates rulers for those different realms. So on day four, he creates uh, the luminaries. Uh, he creates the sun and the moon, the things that uh, light up our world. And verse 16 of chapter one tells us why he did that. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. Oh, and he also made the stars. It's a lovely footnote to the creation account, isn't it? Oh, by the way, uh, God also made the stars. But did you see in verse 16 the sort of um, the purpose of the sun and the moon? They're to govern, to rule the realm of light and dark, day and night, that God created on the first day the ruler for the realm. Then day five, uh, God creates the birds and the fish. And admittedly, it doesn't say in Genesis 1 that explicitly that they rule over the uh, sky and the sea. Uh, but there is a sense in which, isn't there, that fish have dominion over the sea. They, they can live there in a way that we can't. And the birds have uh, dominion uh, over the sky. That's their home much more uh, than it's ours. And then on day six, he created animals, and climatically, he created mankind. And he created mankind, he says, to rule over all. Have a look at verse uh, 26 with me. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Now, these verses, again, they're some of those ones which we really want to click on, follow the links to see what they have to say about all sorts of different areas of our lives. And again, we're going to be doing that uh, in our home groups. But for now, let's just uh, focus in on what they say about how we're to rule over his creation, what being made in God's image means uh, for that. And perhaps the simplest way to see it is to look at the middle of verse 28 
where God says to mankind, fill the earth and subdue it. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now, a moment ago, I said the first three days of creation uh, can be thought of as God creating three different realms uh, that are ruled over by the things he creates in the second uh, three days. But a slightly different way of thinking about the same thing is to think about in the first uh, three days, God forming uh, the world. And in the second uh, three days, filling uh, the world. So the first uh, three, it's like he's forming these things, bringing them out of the uh, formless, empty chaos that was there uh, before. And then in the second three days, he's filling uh, the world that he's subdued uh, with the order he's brought from chaos. Uh, filling, forming, subduing. That's how God created the world. And that's exactly how God tells mankind to rule over the world, fill the earth, subdue it. The way we're to, to rule the world is exactly the way in which he created the world. Genesis 1, it sort of presents God as this great king overall. And it says we're to rule as his representatives. And I guess that's what monarchs do, uh, isn't it? They they get people to do things as their representatives, to act in their stead. So I don't know if you saw this uh, news story earlier uh, in the week. Quite understandably, the Queen is, is not able to host the royal garden parties this summer. And so other members of the royal family are going to host them in her place. But of course, they're hosting them as her representative. Um, they're not doing it in their own right. It's not as if Buckingham Palace is suddenly their residence. And of course, they'll be expected to host those garden parties just as the Queen would. Um, as she does, they'll have to give time to, to meet the guests, to speak to the guests. They won't just be able to run off to their tent and hide away and have tea or whatever it is you do at uh, these garden parties. They're to um, host as her representative and so it is with humanity as we uh, fill the earth as we subdue it in God's stead uh, we're to do it in a way that he would want it done in a way that's pleasing uh, to him again that's something we'll think about more in our home groups that God made us in his image and so we should rule as his representatives and then uh, finally from these uh, verses God rested when his work was done and so we should come to him for rest have a look down at verse 2 of chapter 2 at the end of our reading by the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing so on the seventh day he rested from all his work then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, I don't know about you, but when I rest, it's not because I'm finished. It's, well, I am finished, but I haven't finished what I'm meant to be doing. I'm exhausted. I'm knackered. I've got nothing left. Again, you might have this experience, often you rest, but you can't really rest because you're thinking about all the things you should be doing or you feel you should be doing. But that wasn't the case with God. What did it say? He finished the work that he'd been doing. And so he rested from it all. Day seven sounds idyllic, doesn't it? The work is done rest to be enjoyed and that's why verse 3 tells us God made this day holy because it's space where humanity were meant to stay meant to remain meant to be enjoying God's finished work resting with him 
And we see that in how the day's open-ended. I don't know if you, you notice, but there's no, and there was evening and there was morning, the eighth day. The seventh day is just presented as going on and on and on. It's a picture of what we were made to enjoy, made to enjoy uh, God's finished work. But of course, as uh, we'll see in the coming weeks, and as we know that all know from bitter uh, experience, that's not where we are. That's not a rest we naturally enjoy because uh, things went wrong. Things went wrong. And they went wrong because I guess humanity didn't do all the things that we were thinking about uh, earlier. They didn't worship God alone. They didn't listen to his voice. They didn't rule as his representatives. And so they weren't able to rest with him. But the good news, the good news of the Christian faith is that God didn't abandon his creation when it all went wrong. In fact, as as, um, you'll know, he entered his creation in the person of Jesus Christ. And he said to all those who had turned their back on him, come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And what? I will give you rest. I will give you rest. And it's why, as Jesus died on the cross to secure that rest for us, what did he say? It is finished. It's done. It's why, as we said in the creed earlier, that that Jesus is sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He sat down. His work is done. It's done. But if you're a a Christian here today, or perhaps if you wouldn't call yourself a Christian, maybe you'll have picked up from talking to a Christian friend or neighbour or colleague. We're not there yet. Life isn't easy. It doesn't always, maybe ever, actually feel restful. Because although God's work of creating is finished, although Jesus' work of salvation is finished, uh, we're not back in the seventh day yet, as it were. That's why in the uh, New Testament bit of the Bible, in the letter to the Hebrews, we read these words. Uh, There remains then a Sabbath rest. In other words, a a seventh day rest, the sort of rest that God enjoys in Genesis 2. For the people of God, for anyone who enters God rests, also rests from their work, just as God did from his. And we're told, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. And we may think, oh, that sounds good. That sounds like something that I would enjoy. But, oh, making every effort to enter that rest, really? That just sounds so exhausting on top of everything else. Well, that's where you find yourself. The good news is all we have to do is accept that invitation from Jesus. All we need to do is to come to the one who has finished his work. And he will give us rest. It's a promise. He makes a promise we can trust. And as we wait for that day, well, do you know what? It's a really good habit to stop every seven days. It's a really good habit uh, once a week to to set aside our labours and to come together and remember God's finished work. It's really good to be here, uh, to be at church. That's why church is, or at least should be, a point of refreshment in your week. Because it's a small taste of enjoying that Sabbath rest, that seventh day rest that one day we'll enjoy forever as we rest in God's finished work. Because that's what he did. He rested when his work was done. And so we should come uh, to him for rest.
You see, this first bit of uh, Genesis, it, it's not about creation, really. Uh, it's much more about the creator, the one who made it all, and how, how we're to relate to him as his creatures. And what do these verses tell us? Well, we've seen that God created the heavens and the earth. He made everything. And so we should worship him alone. Uh, we've seen that God spoke the world into being. And so we should listen to his voice. That God made us in his image to rule as his representatives. And that God rested uh, when his work was done, that we might come to him uh, for rest. I'm going to lead us uh, in a prayer, asking that knowing those things about God would change us to live uh, in those ways. Uh, let me pray to God. Our Father, we praise you again as the creator of everything. Uh, we marvel at your power. Uh, we're in awe of your creativity. Uh, we want to celebrate the order that you bring. And so we pray that you might help us do the things we've been thinking about this morning. Uh, we pray that we'd worship you alone as our creator, our sustainer, our saviour. Uh, we pray we listen to your voice, even when it's hard, even when perhaps you say things that, that we find uncomfortable. Please will we listen, knowing that your words are powerful and life-giving and bring about things that are good. And Father, we uh, pray that you would help us to look after your world as you would have us look after it, that we'd rule over it well as your representatives. As we were praying earlier, we're sorry for when we get that wrong and we pray for your help. And Father, we, um, we read this description of rest, of stopping because everything's done. And it sounds wonderful. And we thank you that if we are, if we've come to Jesus, we have that to look forward to. And we pray that you might, um, Keep us going, keep us trusting, keep us holding fast to your promises that we might enjoy that one day. Uh, or indeed, if this is all new to us, uh, that we might come to Jesus for the very first time, knowing that in him uh, we can find rest. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.